Hey folks, it's Penguin and uh, from the Agora Podcast, and I'm here with Sec and a bunch of our friends. And today we have a, a very large and hopefully very lively roundtable discussion for you. Uh, Sec, would you like to introduce the topic of our roundtable discussion? Yeah. So today we're we're doing a panel discussion on food as a weapon. Um, the inspiration for this idea came to me in two parts. One, reading um, or listening to uh, a Derek Bros video named as such called Food as a Weapon, which goes into the history of the food industry. And then also listening to um, the Let's Make Some Shit podcast where they had BJ and also uh, a friend of ours, Derica, who changed um, their health through uh, diet and lifestyle choices and that sort of thing. So um, I was listening to that while I was working and I just, I came up with the idea to have a panel discussion about this. Now the, the, the idea of this panel is to discuss it in two ways and we can go for wherever from there, but one, how food has been used as a, a, a method of control by the state and the powers that be over populations. And then also how food could be used as a weapon to gain more independence and autonomy in your own life. Uh, that is being the general premise, but we can take the discussion wherever we want to go after that. Um, but I think we should start with introductions and I'm going to try to do that in an orderly fashion. And um, I think we'll do that alphabetically and um, just giving it yourself an introduction and who you are, what do you do? And um, uh any sort of discussion will 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 take place after about the topics will take place after the introductions are done. So um, that would be <laughs> I know my alphabet. That would be BJ. BJ, you're up first. Um, tell us who you are and and what do you do. Um, so I'm BJ. I am in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. I've lived and worked here for all my life, and um, so I'm interested in this particular discussion because I, I came to my path for, to liberty was basically through food and food um, choices and um, health consequences of certain foods and certain choices, um, how foods are sourced. And so um, I consider myself an urban sort of newbie homesteader. I make everything that I eat, basically almost everything I eat. Um, I am a carnivore by season. So in the summer, I eat vegetables when they're in my garden. Um, but for the most part, I eat animals, um, meat, eggs, fish, some dairy, um, mostly goat dairy or mature dairy. Not, um, I have an issue with cow dairy that's liquid sometimes. But I'm um, interested in this panel because it's a very, um, it's a very timely topic, but also because it's it's like my passion in life. So I appreciate having um, the ability to talk to you guys about this stuff. Let me jump in because I forgot to say something. So we have a, a lot of different people here with a lot of different perspectives. And I would um, like to be able to show our audience and um, everyone else who may listen to this how we can... Uh, disagree but still be excellent to each other you know um we all i think would have very similar conclusions but possibly different methods of how to get there um so if we can just all keep um any kind of disagreements civil that would be good um we're all friends here so brian you're that was not directed to you bj at all so um Oh, no, directed at me. <laughs> yeah no, it's not, oh, okay. i'm talking to you brian i'm talking yeah. to you no yeah no yeah. Yeah. So, so we're the we're the radical vegetarians here. No, you're not the, no, you're not the only ones here. I mean, we have everybody from radical vegetarians to rad, radical carnivores, and everybody. <laughs> everybody's cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Right on. Um, so, I guess I'll start off. Uh, so, I am uh, Dr. Brian Sovereign, uh, host of the Sovereign Tech Podcast. Um, certainly, health is a major, major subject um, of the show. Uh, it's unavoidable. Usually, you know, it basically started off with. Um, health and diet. And I've gone through, you know, quite a dietary journey, you know, to finally land where, where I'm at. Um, but, you know, technology and how that relates to human health was certainly a major part of it, but that bleed can't help but bleed into, you know, physical fitness, um, 
you know, dietary choices and all that, you know, certainly became a, an aspect of the show uh, as well. Um, and I'm a major proponent of uh, something that I say often on Sovereign Tech, which is one of the pathways to uh, getting out from underneath authoritarianism is to simply outlive the state. So I take health pretty seriously. I'm also one of those crazy people who thinks I, I don't have to die. But anyway, so I can sound as you know, nuttier than any, everyone else. I'm perfectly uh, comfortable with that. But my far more rational half um, is also here for this, uh, that being Ellen Sovereign. Ellen, you want to introduce yourself as well? Uh, sure. So I am the editor of the Sovereign Technica newsletter, or, or at least one of them. Um, I am also a scientist. I've studied a lot of engineering, uh, biochemical and chemical. Um, so this is kind of something that I've been passionate about for a long time. Um, I, I come to this discussion from a, a mostly whole foods plant-based perspective. So uh, like most of the time our diet is vegan, though occasionally we'll indulge in, you know, cheese or fish, but that's, that's pretty rare. Um, I'm with Brian in the sense that uh, diet is a way to achieve liberty in the sense of having the optimal life experience, you know, having energy, being vital. Um, so I'm really glad to be here and really interested to hear what everyone else's perspective is as well. Nice. Uh, who's next? Yes, I'm saying the alphabet in my head. Um, Dejun, that's you. I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for having me on here, Sec. I really do appreciate it. Um, but a little bit about me: I am from the southwest of the U.S., specifically New Mexico. Um, I don't do I have I don't have an occupation right now because I'm currently a senior or the last year of the weird social experiment in America called high school. Um, so I'm pretty glad we have getting out of that. Um, things about me so i'm pretty kind of the standard anarchist just kind of want to go live in the woods help the community out grow some food for yourself um and i'm planning to do that pretty soon and then also i'm an independent satanist and i would say that's pretty much it right on that brings us to keith McHenry. <clears throat> okay well i'm keith McHenry, and i'm a co-founder of the global movement food not bombs and I've been um, mostly a vegan since uh, 1973. And, um, and I've written a bunch of books on that issue, most recently the Anarchist Cookbook. And I live in Santa Cruz, California, and uh, where we share food every single day and uh, outside at the town clock. How many steady days have you guys been giving out food and, and where you're at? Um, it was 900 days exactly on August 31st. Awesome. Yeah, every single day. Makes me <laughs> smile every time. All right, okay. That brings us to Penguin. You want to jump in here? Yeah, um, if you're listening to this through our podcast, you know me. I'm Penguin. Um, I co-host the Agora podcast with SEC. Um, uh, just generally a guy that kind of posts and talks about uh, politics a bunch, um, makes and edits, produces the podcast. Um, not doing a whole lot of food production right now, though I do work, I do like to work in the dirt and in the ground and um, just a, a guy with a bunch of different ideas about kind of, kind of the material base of, of liberty. So it's basically what we talk about on the podcast is not just the, <clears throat> not just the idea, ideas or the idealist version of uh, liberty or liberation, but actually the material basis of like doing production and organizing thing and things and having like uh, modes of exchange um, and actually doing them and actually um, so talking and having discussions, but not just about ideas, but about actually uh, making, building, creating things and exchanging with each other, which is ultimately the basis of what we're um, trying to get to um, at least at least the full half of it, if not for just the theory. So um, that's basically it for me. Right on, and that brings us to Ray. Hey guys, I'm Ray. Thanks for having me on. Um, I am half of the Let's Make Some Shit podcast with Sex Lady. Um, 
and I am an agorist and homesteader. We raise, um, pastor raised chicken. Um, and I'm also a recovering addict who was extremely malnourished and very sick. And um, so I'm really interested in this food panel today because I can attest firsthand about, you know, the significance of your health of improving your diet and kind of coming really back from the brink of death. And I am on a forever journey to that way of life. And I just love learning new things and um, constantly improving my diet and my life to live a healthier and longer life. And I'm just really excited to hear what you guys all have to say and maybe implement some new changes into my life still. Nice. Sorry, I'm really bad at inter introductions. <laughs> no, that was good. That was perfect. Rail, it's you. All right. Yeah. So uh, I've this. Uh, so yeah, my name is uh, Shane. Uh, kind of go by uh, Rayo too now. Um, people start calling me that. Um, but so uh, yeah, I uh, do the the Vani podcast, uh, and uh, I I uh, have a twenty two acre homestead here. And uh, what I've called uh, the Free Republic of Pasnia. So we've, yeah, we raise uh, lambs and goats and chickens, ducks and turkeys. Uh, I've got some gardens, and uh, yeah, it sounds like a lot of us are doing a lot of similar things. So that's uh, that's awesome. And I guess what um, brings me particularly to <clears throat> to this discussion is. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, I've been a, you know, an anarchist focused on solutions for years, but, um, yeah, in 20, was it was 2018, 2019, uh, 2018, I guess it was, tw I think it was 2019. I made a, a lifestyle, like a dietary lifestyle change, um, to try to, um, I guess as a start to reverse my so-called type one diabetes. And, uh, it's been a long journey since then. Um, and, uh, you know, and gone down a, a lot of different, a lot of different roads. And, uh, I guess now since, uh, um, I, I guess I'm kind of, kind of switching a little bit, um, currently, um, but, uh, primarily, uh, I guess, yeah, nose to tail carnivore. Um, but I've been yeah, working in more, um, you know, more, um, natural carbohydrate, na natural carbs and natural amounts and, you know, natural, you know, prepared, prepared, uh, correctly, like our, like our ancestors did, um, like to actually soaking, you know, long grain Indian rice and such. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's a little, little background, uh, background for me. And that brings it to me, um. I'm sick. Uh, I've been a, a lifelong homesteader. Uh, I was born and raised vegetarian on an organic homestead. And so very early on, I was um, very much interested in where my food comes from and having more, um, being concerned with what was going into my body and having more or organic sources of food. Uh, I'm no longer a vegetarian, but um, we, I, to me, the most important things that we can do is gain control over uh, what food we put in our body, whatever that may be. And also, uh, I believe food production is possibly the the most important uh, tool that we could, we have at our disposal um, to gain more freedom in our own lives. Um, so that's always been something that's been very important to me. Um, but yeah, that's me. Um, also, I like sticking my hands in the dirt and growing things. So I, I am guilty of that. Um, I never grew up. I still like playing in the dirt. So um, I guess that leads us to, let's start with in what ways, and we'll go around the group again, in what ways has food been used as a tool of control over populations by the state or other powers that be? Um, Brian and Ellen, you guys had uh, the hard stop, so we'll, we'll let you guys go first. Um, what what are some examples of this or what are your thoughts on that? Sure, um, do you want me to start off? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, a couple of, of quick things. Um, I think there, there's, there's pretty good evidence historically that even if it wasn't the state, that we can also look at evidence for the state to do so. Um, like controlling diet to create um, desired outcomes in attitude and in culture uh, is, I mean, it's not conspiracy, it's a fact. Um, you could look at William Kellogg, who, you know, was making I mean, who, you know, was part of what started the Kellogg, you know, cereal company. Um, this was a guy who, A, was a nut job, but B, um, 
you know, his desire for like introducing a lot of different foods, uh, particularly like with cereal, uh, was, I mean, like it, it was part and parcel of getting like desired attitudes and more, uh, shall we say conservative attitudes. Um, I mean, he was, he also had crazy ideas about like doing terrible things to women's genitalia. Uh, I mean, like, so diet was a part of his strategy of creating the culture that he wanted. Um, he was also an Adventist, but you know, we don't have to necessarily get into that. My point being is that people who started major corporations that exist today had pretty crazy ideas and goals for their, you know, their dietary motives and what they were putting into the world, what they were like, what kind of foods they were creating and putting on the market. Um, not only that, you also have the case, uh, there's a fantastic book. Like I, I know that the, the kind of the title of this podcast we're doing right now is uh, food as a, as a weapon. And it, it could be said as like food is a weapon against us. Uh, there's a fantastic book that came out a few years ago by John Potash called Drugs as a Weapon Against Us. And it talks quite a bit about how the U.S. government, and again, not conspiracy, it's fact, uh, how the U.S. government, you know, the FBI particularly, was using drugs uh, or, you know, uh, injecting, shall we say, drugs into varying revolutionary movements and cultures throughout the 60s and 70s to try and quell them, um, like the Black Panthers and some others. Uh, so the idea that, you know, things that we ingest, uh, you know, or that, like that what we ingest is being used by authoritarians, again, not conspiracy, it's a fact. To what degree that goes and, you know, what it means with, with like the modern American diet today or what often gets called the sad diet, right, the standard American diet, uh, you know, there might be some debate there, but the attitudes that food or what, again, what we ingest gets used against us is an absolute fact. You know, there's, there's just, there, there's nothing around that. Um, I've also, I recently did a show and I, I think you had heard it sec as well. I mean, where, where I had talked about that, you know, so many people like the idea that, oh, making a lot of money, you know, like that's so important right now. I'm not saying that making money is a bad thing. But I think that actually food, like getting out from under the need for money is actually a far more important venture to engage in. And I know that's going to be a subject throughout this, uh, that, yeah, you know, producing your own food, like gets you out from under the really because like money is based around the economy. And, you know, we only have to look at inflation today. Um, you know, how much money could you save? You talk about, well, can I save money by using a coupon at the store? No. How much money could you save if you actually grew your own food? You know, like these are, so I bring all this up just to say that there are very provable and easy things to show that food can be used against us. And we in turn can use food to against, you know, a lot of parts of the economy and, uh, you know, authoritarianism that maybe aren't so directly under our control as individuals. So uh, Ellen, do you wanna, wanna add in anything there? Yeah, and if you grow your own food, you don't even need money for something well, like exactly, that. Well, exactly, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as far as, uh, you know, desired outcomes for specific foods, I think it's pretty clear, especially um, with the internet and the availability of certain publications, that industry is directly funding uh, politicians and is giving money to government agencies to help them, you know, push certain agendas. And it's, it's pretty obvious, especially when you look at industries like corn syrup, which is in almost everything, which is super unhealthy compared to regular table sugar. Um, you know, it causes a much higher glycemic index. Um, it's, it's just crazy because these foods are being pushed so much, and that's also causing uh, these chronic long-term illnesses, which are being treated by the pharmaceutical industry which you could also argue the pharmaceutical industry is part of this because we ingest drugs or inject them. Um, and there's really no incentive to cure the, the diseases themselves. Um, and, you know, it's all just part of that money and power dynamic that, that Brian was talking about. But if we grow our own foods and eat healthy well, the way that our bodies are intended to eat, um, you know, then we don't need that system. We don't need that help. And then we're outside that whole uh, power scheme. And that can be dangerous in itself. It's, it's more like, a sh you know, using food as a shield 
<laughs> right. as opposed to a weapon um it as a way to empower us as individuals to be outside of that system and to live longer healthier lives or to outlive the state as you would say all right very well said um i agree 100 percent. right on um i think keith had the next hard potential stop so keith we'll let you uh we'll let you do um your bit um Okay. How does how has food been used as a weapon? Well, I think one of the quotes that I find interesting is Kissinger's control oil and you control nations, control food, and you control the people. And we can see that um, withholding food as, as a tactic is, is something that has been used for a long, long time. And the other thing is I... I do agree that basically the food industry is a weapon and that it is um, essentially providing toxic it's like uh, chemical warfare against the population and anybody that does a lot of any traveling outside the u.s you it, it's uh, always incredible to me how you, as soon as you enter the united states and eat even organic vegan food it is so much um um, if that you buy in stores and so on, it's just, it, you just feel horrible, uh, relative to the way it is, even commercial food in other countries. And, um, so from that point of view, it is also seems to be an aspect of dumbing down, weakening the, the, um, population in the United States so that, um, you know, that's easier to control people. So that's one thing. Then there was a mention of, uh, drugs as a weapon and the same uh, in the 60s, my grandfather would, was involved in uh, organizing the heroin trade to the U.S. during World War II for the purpose of putting down the black community so they would not uh, rise up when they did not get to share in the GI Bill as white people were. And um, he talked a lot about that. But then we also see that currently where drugs are flooded intentionally into communities to put them down. And and that, that's happening in the homeless community here in Santa Cruz, where um, somebody is uh, giving out free meth and so on and, and putting uh, um, fentanyl into little baggies of marijuana and leaving them around town. And one po toke and you die. So, uh, you know, this is part of, I think, an overall strategy of maintaining control. And also now, what are we at the point where it's only... Um, what is it? It's uh, six multinational corporations control most of the uh, food business. Not 95% um, of the grains are controlled by those six countries. And we can see now that withholding food from, um, say, communities in Ethiopia intentionally as a strategy is being used. Um, there's a lot of conversation as to uh, around whether Russia is withholding food to starve countries, or is this that the NATO that's doing that in the US, you know, so there's back and forth, there's, that's really big. And we have uh, finally, you know, um, uh, Joe Biden saying that because of sanctions against Russia, we have to expect food shortages everywhere, including here in the United States. And I know as a person that tries to feed a lot of people every day, um, we are already getting to that point where a lot of foods that we traditionally could get for either recovering from Trader Joe's or from the food bank and other places just doesn't, it just doesn't exist anymore. So that could easily be put in a situation in the near term where you have to comply with government regulations if you want to get a, your food ration. And, um, and so I think food as a weapon is definitely high on the ideology of the state in the United States, the U.S. government, and transnational corporations for social control. Very well said. And I would just like to butt in real quick and point out some historical examples. Um, you know, you talk about like the Irish potato famine or go back even further, and it was commonplace in warfare to lay siege to crops and um, food production. That was how, how warfare was done years ago. 
And just pointing out the fact that uh, you don't think that, that that strategy has been updated to the modern era. I mean, okay, maybe we're not burning fields now, but um, all you have to do is control it or, or water it down or poison it to the point where it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't nourish you any longer. So that's, you know, it's the same, you know, it's the same strategy, just uh, <laughs> updated for, for modern warfare. Um, let's go to somebody else. Um, does anybody want to jump in? I will. BJ, go for it. Um, yeah, so this is an example. I think it's not something I'm super passionate about. I don't like conspiracy theories, but I'd like to expound upon what um, Dr. Brian said about um, the fact that the the, um, the, the, the the Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller conglomeration um, at the turn of the 20th century basically uh, was, you know, starting the impetus towards total power over food and medicine, education, finance, uh, medical education. Um, and, and not to say that, you know, education, blah, 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 but um, they basically made it so that, um, well, so um, Abraham Flexner published something in 1910, so a few years before this, um, that dictated basically um, a set of structures that wanted to sort of, I guess, unionize uh, the standard of care. This is where uh, the white lab coat and physiological medicine versus natural medicine and functional medicine started to take over um, basically and become the modern day uh, Western medical situation that we have the last, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. Um, that, that people alive today are familiar with. Anyone who was born, you know, from the 1920s until whenever is familiar with Western medicine. And the reason that we know about this stuff is because of this report that basically said, you know, hey, we're going to centralize all of these things and turn them into industrial complexes. I mean, in, in so many words, but I'm paraphrasing, obviously, uh, this big paper that was written and uh, the whole thing is just like this gigantic sort of dictionary of like how, you know, United States general education and food education and financial information and just all of this information is just suddenly under control of these, you know, ridiculously wealthy people, um, you know, and it's like, okay, we're going to take, uh, we're going to, th this is why I think it's uh, used as a weapon because they basically turned um, food and herbs, which are medicine, they turned all of that on its ear and basically, uh, you know, taking the natural world around us um, and saying that, you know, it can't be medicine. It can't be, you can't have proper nutrition to heal diseases. Uh, we're merely going to just treat symptoms of whatever you walk in here with, uh, with pharmaceutical solutions. Um, and, and this turns people's health into you know, very poor situations and just a lifetime of abuse by, by the medical system, basically. Um, and so that's why I know I'm kind of with a lot of the stuff that Shane was saying, which is kind of going back to nature and, you know, healing myself. I had a lot of health problems, like, um, and so basically being able to turn against all of this information that I was raised on you know, the food pyramid is a huge weapon, I think. And all the my plate and all the myfood.gov and all this other stuff, it's like, it's a bunch of horse shit. But yet there are a lot of people in the liberty and anarchy community who still think that something is going to give you a disease. If you, you know, if you eat this, you're going to have, you know, a heart disease. If you eat this, you're going to get cancer. And it's like, I'm sorry, but that's it's brainwashing that's what they did the, they did this to us they did this to us starting with our grandparents generation i don't know how old you guys are i'm going to be 50 in less than a year so um that's just kind of my opinion it's you know it's just what it is so yeah right on that's just your opinion man um <laughs> dudeism um ray you're up uh you wanted to talk um, yeah, I was just kind of thinking along the same lines as BJ there. I was kind of thinking about the food pyramid. And um, I used to listen to this podcast about conspiracy theories. And um, 
there'd be two episodes I'd like lay out the facts and then the next one they'd kind of like judge whether they're true or not but there was one on big sugar you know and how they used to say that oh you know butters and fats and saturated fats you know are bad and but sugar's okay you know sugary cereal and um you know and then it came out that you know that people that were behind these studies you know kind of basically falsified the information or made it appear you know a certain way but anyway that episode basically gave a 10 out of 10 you know that that conspiracy was true but i think a lot of it comes down to a false belief in authority you know i mean there's so many people especially these last few years with this like glorification of elites and science you know um experts in their field and everything that so many people just have these problems and go to you know their doctor and trust what they say when i don't even know how many times you hear people that go to the doctor and they just i mean automatically throw pills at you instead of telling people okay you need to change your diet you know and that's true but at the same time i mean there's nobody stopping that, that person that realizes that oh you know just throwing medication at me it's like well you can still change your diet <laughs> you know you don't need to be told by a doctor to do that um i think that's all i was going to add to that right on well said uh penguin you wanted to say something yeah i mean we keep talking about these conspiracy theories and uh, i like i like to be a guy, the guy that says um i don't really do a lot of conspiracy theories kind of like bj says but what's a conspiracy but like two or more people the planning on some planning something or discussing and well, planning something in private and secret that's necessarily what a, con a conspiracy theory is and uh, you know there's very like fairly simplistic material straightforward reasons we have like the dietary recommendations and they came out with the uh, different versions of the food pyramid or whatever shapes they um revised it to is that basically you know like we said we have the the big sugar that played a very important strategic role as a major international industry they've got grain which is a strategic resource from all the countries to produce tons of grain and it's just kind of like a it's a way that that countries or nations or, or sorry states have been structured for a long time to kind of um store and accumulate a lot of grain or a lot of um uh, yeah, grains and similar stuff, rice or whatever, depending on what part of the world you're in, um, because they're storable or they're divisible for taxation. There's lots of different theories, and I don't want to get too much into that because every time you you kind of get on one anthropological theory or the other, like uh, someone has a counterpoint or counterexamples to that. But generally, that's been the case, and we have mentioned that like grains, um, because of th their nature, have been kind of the building blocks of states, at least to an extent like i said i've heard some work we should discuss about how that's um some there's some people questioning that theory but that's we know that's true now that like the large scale food uh, especially grain production soybeans and stuff like that this uh, produce on very massive scales are considered like strategic resources in the world and um they're they fuel armies and they fuel cut growing countries but um, so they're they're important base for uh, a state to grow and have control of and make you know stabilize the prices, make there be a uh, constant um, demand and constant consumption of this stuff. Maybe create alternative uses like they do with corn and the corn fuel, the corn ethanol that's not particularly great for engines or a lot of engines that weren't kind of tuned for that. Um, but th there's always, when there is a conspiracy, it's usually a very easy conspiracy to understand. And that conspiracy can usually be whittled down to the dollars and cents that are going in and out of pockets that have been for uh, centuries in the case of, or grades millennia, but with like sugar um, centuries. Penguin with the uh, with the James C. Scott reference again. I like it. Um, can't go wrong. Um, okay, uh, Brian and Ellen, you you want to say something? Yeah, I want to get something in, kind of piggybacking off of what what Penguin was saying. In that, yeah. um, I mean, I do think we've been part of a like a very large experiment um, that is, some of which is falling apart now. For example, the low fat diet. 
you know, has been like the standard in America uh, for decades and for as far back as most people can remember, really. And I mean, now we're getting to the point where, yes, a lot of the, you know, established uh, um, doctors and so on are admitting, OK, yeah, no, that's that's not right. Um, a big part of that, you know, like Penguin was saying about following the dollars and cents. I mean, you know, I'm a big believer in following the attitude as much as the money. But there's times where following the money certainly makes a lot of sense. No pun intended there. Uh, and, you know, we look at something like margarine, which was like the savior of civilization when I grew up in the 80s. Um, I'm 41 now. So but anyway, like at the time, like everything was margarine. Don't touch butter. Don't touch butter. Everything's margarine. And you actually look at a lot of other of these, a lot of other staples of the low fat diet. And it's odd that most of what became staples for the low fat diet are things that you yourself cannot produce in your backyard. It's all food chemistry and food science that produces a lot of the low fat diet. Um, and a part of me can't help but wonder if there was, I mean, because we live, you know, within the system that we have it's the church of eternal growth. Now I don't know what's behind the church of eternal growth, like why they think that the economy just has to constantly grow, 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 grow. And why we can't exist in some like steady state or zero state growth uh, for a little while, because I mean, you know, life's pretty good at the advanced level that we're at um, as far as, you know, more material or creature comforts say go. Um, but there's some desire for them to just constantly make more and more money. And food is one of those things that's just, like the the really you know the food that you can grow in your backyard like you can't make a ton of money off of that you you honestly you just can't and so it, it's hard for me not to think that there were groups involved that wanted uh a diet and a style of food you know that that only they could produce and so that they could make you know all all the profiteering could happen off of that um now i mean some of that is speculation on my part but it's a strange thing, but also it's important to note that like science move is is in many ways a slow moving ship. And I'm glad that the low fat diet is, say, you know, kind of dying off um, and that some reality is being brought into this because a lot of it came from poor science. I mean, a lot of a lot of food facts or food science that we, you know, or diet science, dietary uh, uh, you know facts that we accept, you know, come from like studying rats. Right. And, you know, rats aren't humans. You know, and and I again, that's another thing that I think a lot of people are are kind of waking up to, uh, which I'm glad that that's happening. But yeah, I don't I don't think the people that were wanting to profiteer off of say like the low fat diet or things like margarine, which are now you know again margarine is widely accepted as a bad thing for you. You know, it's like everybody's back to buying butter. It seems. Um, I don't think they're going to let go of the reins. But anyway, I just wanted to add that in on top of the uh, the, the profiteering comment that that Penguin was making that I thought was right on. Yeah, and certainly all the incentives are there and all the profits were made, you know. So whether right. it was some it, – it's almost irrelevant whether it was some grand pre-planned conspiracy or something that just worked out for them. You know, it doesn't really matter in the sense that um, the incentives lined up and they were able to shift the culture in such a way and they made a lot – and it worked and they made a lot of money, you know. So uh, – but a lot of people got uh, unhealthy, we'll say, because of all those, you know um, – I remember those times, you know, all those diets that were being pushed in the eighties and early nineties. And I think we're, I think you're right that a lot of that is sort of falling away mainly through a general healthy skepticism of, uh, experts. Um, Ray, you were up first. Um, and then, well, go ahead, Brian, you, you had something to respond to me, I think. Uh, well, actually, it's it's me. I was just going to say that um, I, I believe that's still continuing. I mean, the, it's not the low fat diet anymore, but like uh, saturated fats, mm -hmm. trans fats, um, sugar, especially animal fats, like all of these things are added into food now to make them extra flavorful and potent. And it completely changes our, our palate. So we're like addicted to this food. But um, it's like the majority of what is in the aisles of the grocery store. So clearly there's still a lot of money being made. Um, you know, it's not the low fat diet anymore, but now it's it's like sugar um, and, and these other like salty high flavor foods that's that's a real cash cow for these industries. And see, yeah, that's the problem, right? Is food, we, somehow we allowed food to become an industrial system. 
right? It's a, uh, it's a uh, almost like a factory production system now versus having any kind of <clears throat> excuse me any kind of relationship with our personal relationship with our food. It's done at a mass scale by huge industrial systems who uh again it's it's like brian said it's growth overall you know it's it doesn't matter it's not about providing value value for value or creating good relationships with the person your farmer down the road um or growing it yourself it's it's not about uh, uh, gaining food to nourish yourself and having a healthy relationship with that it's just how much product can we push and how much waste product can we stuff into this food? How much industrial lubricant can we push into this food before people will start dying and we can get, you know, get rid of this waste system from our other industrial companies? You know, it's, it's turned, I don't know who said it, but it's turned food on its head into this gross, like multinational conglomerate corporation, corporate form that disgusts me. Um, but I, I'm sorry, Ray, you wanted to say something, rant, rant over. Um, um, yeah, I would just, uh, what you guys talk about the profit and everything. So one of the books that I read in the beginning of my journey to liberty was Michael Poland's The Omnivore's Dilemma. And like a large portion of that book is devoted to corn. And it talks about how, you know, when they realized that, you know, they can grow a lot of corn, it grows really well, that instead of growing the corn that they needed, they grew as much as they could. And they're like, oh shit, you know, now what are we going to do with all this corn? I mean, I think we all know how many, you know, byproducts and shit is made from corn, like corns and everything. And, uh, um, you know, we're not meant to eat that much corn. So they find all these ways, you know, can, to continue making money off of this, no matter, you know, at the expense of the people and their diets. Um, but, um, and then as, you know, taking that to another level, you know, they start feeding corn to things like cows and animals that aren't meant to eat corn. So then you're making, you know, these animals sick. So we're all eating sick meat, you know, if you get it from the grocery store and not locally, or if you don't know where your food came from, you know, I mean, those animals aren't meant to eat like that. And then, so we're just eating their crap. Yummy, sick meat. Yeah, again, and it's, it, you know, it's lobbying by these corporations, right? That's There's a huge corn lobby. Um, who hasn't yet got to speak? Rail? Rail, you want to jump in here? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I yeah, I've, I've love everything I've heard so far. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, really good context. Uh, Ellen, you brought up conflicts of interest and, uh, the, the first, like, I guess something, a realization I've, I guess I came to over the past couple of few years is that, um, it's like basically the food industries now own, uh, or I guess now the food industries and the pharmaceutical industries are basically the same. So, um, there's, yeah, there's literal incentive for them to, you know, literal, literal incentive for them to poison, uh, you know, poison people. Um, and then thinking back to earlier agriculture companies, like, uh, um, like, uh, I guess earlier, I guess, uh, um, like Cyanamid, which was big into, uh, well, I guess, a big early ag company. Well, they are the creators of Cyanide. And I think they also made like TNT and stuff too. So like the food manufacturers, like they didn't come from like a very like nice and loving place, right? Um, so I guess that's the, the first thing I would, I would just mention kind of in, in terms of background. But um, as far as food being used as a weapon, um, you know, I guess, uh, so I mentioned that, you know, I eat a lot, like no, no still carnivores. So, like if I eat, um, if I eat organs, like I want to be really high quality, right? Like I don't want to eat, like we were talking about the, the quality of the, of the meat at the grocery store. Yeah. Don't eat that liver or anything like that. That's, that's not, not, not wise. So I order from, uh, um, I order from this guy, uh, Frank, uh, Frankie's free range meats. And, uh, he's, uh, um, he gets, you know, like really, really high quality stuff that you really can't find anywhere else. Like, for example, like pasture raised, you know, I guess Spanish pasture raised, uh, rabbit kidneys um for example like stuff you can't find here like uh, milk fed uh, milk fed veal kidney um you can't really find anywhere else so he sells a lot of really unique stuff um well he recently got he recently had like a dozen swap people come show up to his, his place of business um because he was selling um i guess there was there was some products he was i guess there's there's some products he was that I guess that he was selling that they, they didn't like. So they, they seized twenty five thousand dollars worth of meats from him. And so I guess he was trying to do some like private membership membership association thing with um, cured sausages. 
and uh, I guess they didn't like the process for it. And uh, um, he 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 feels specifically targeted because there you know there are a handful of bigger companies out there that are doing it. So he thinks that basically um, the USDA is coming after him because he doesn't pay like he's just a small business like a small business owner. He doesn't pay that much in USDA ins- inspection fees. And then there's the fact that he he has all this like super high quality stuff like raw you know like a um, like a cap like caviar eggs and like just like stuff you cannot find. Um, a lot of uh, you know really good high quality you know like raw dairy and. Uh, um, yeah, lots, lots of things. Well, anyway, yeah. So, so the the USDA is is a literal shotgun um, in that, um, and that go, also goes into areas like uh, like raw milk, which is uh, super hard to find for a lot of people um, nowadays. And uh, I think that's a uh, that's a really really terrible thing because um, I'm really big into fermented um, foods and drinks now, and uh, I've been making for the past couple of years um, this uh, I guess this yogurt like um, this yogurt like um, I guess. I don't know what to, what to call it, kefir yogurt type type thing, and um, yeah, fermented fermented foods are incredible, and uh, those uh, raw and fermented foods are really hard to find um, anywhere. And uh, the stuff you find in the grocery stores, um, I'll bring up uh, like kombucha as an example. Um, a lot of kombucha would, um, uh, a lot of kombucha has this uh, this strain in it called Bacillus coagulans, and sometimes it's the only strain in there. Well, it's like this this GMO mutant strain that will like exist, like a, it will survive like temperatures up to like 180 degrees, like not natural at all. But that's the probiotic strain, the patented strain um, that's in most most like in most kombucha. It's not a live wild culture or anything like that. So um, I've kind of the conclusion I've come to is like there are you can find like similar stuff, like similar healthy stuff in grocery stores, but it's never like what you're like. It's it's kind of like the inversion of something really, really good, um, I guess, is is kind of the way that that I've looked at it. Um, but um yeah, I guess that's 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 the biggest thing for me is uh yeah the um yeah the 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 hard yeah hard to find good you know raw and fermented stuff and uh um yeah I think that's problematic. Do you uh do you have any examples you'd like to share of like how food has been used as a method of control by um by those who would wish to control us? Rhea? Um yeah um I suppose uh so I got yeah one one thing I've been looking into a lot recently and it's kind of where kind of where, where I started my where I started my path to so-called type 1 diabetes is um is kind of uh, I guess the the gut microbiome um per se and uh, a lot of like the, uh, the the foods that we eat, or I guess not that I'm not gonna say that because a lot of us don't eat these foods, but the, the foods that a lot of people eat, um, they uh, completely alter um, you know the natural microbiome um, in your gut. So instead of having you know, like a natural balanced um, you know so, you know a, a colony of microorganisms, um, things get out of whack. And um, the gut is what produces things like serotonin and dopamine and uh, other important home hormones are related to happiness, energy, and reproduction and things like that. So um, if they can alter. I mean, like a, all the, like pretty much everything. Um, like pr- we we're, were ta- uh, talking earlier about like th- these things. Like you, our ancestors would never think about putting these things into the drink, like into 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 you know drinks or foods. Um, they would never come to mind because they're all you know like the results of a big industry. But uh, um, yeah, all of these things have you know really really negative impacts uh, impacts on our gut, um, which um, has direct impacts on our hormones, which ties into the brain. Um, it's uh it's it's really really incredible like you can you can literally like directly control the brain with with the gut um and and in a sense so um that would be a a very a very direct way um is hijacking people's um you know natural um you know like a lot of people a lot of people like especially in the 90s um with everything being filled full of sugar and maybe even before that i I just i don't know because i was i was born in the early 90s but um everything was filled full of sugar so like for me like i didn't have a chance i was addicted to sugar before i even had like a like a conscious chance um to to not be um so um yeah it's 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 just uh it's 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 that pervasive where you know these um yeah it's it's just that pervasive so so you mean in a very yeah. like direct chemical warfare sense in the in the sense that if we're poisoning oh, yeah. our, if we're poisoning our guts and that's changing our brain, then that leads us to be more depressed, docile, uh, you know, have mental health issues, health issues. So the ability to resist, we'll yeah. say, uh, is diminished. What that's the uh, yeah. Yeah, 100 100 percent. And if and if people are, are chronically poisoned and you know um, mentally you know mentally sick, um, then yeah, like they're they're not going to be producing um, like their their adrenals are going to be super stressed. They might not pr- be producing um, testosterone if they're males or pr- progesterone if they're females. And um, I mean, so like uh, you know like lack of energy, like not motivated to do anything, like that's a pretty easy 
D, um, that's pretty easy. And I mean, there's a plague of low, you know, low testosterone nowadays, um, as far as I've been able to, to, to ascertain. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely problematic and very, very direct. Yeah. Uh, Drew, you're up last but not least. Well, I'm just going to do something a little bit short. Um, but I was just going to add a little personal note into it is that people have been mentioning a lot of the corporation side of it and of how it's, um, uh, the chemicals and the injections of the food, the um, care of the food through transportation. Um, and I used to work in the produce uh, section of a, car, uh, of a supermarket for a couple months. And always in the back, we used to have just mountains of uh, produce just rotten or just horrible. Or um, we'd, a lot of times, if it was slightly rotten, we'd still set it out. And people just don't understand that's what they're eating. Um, and a lot of times, some of the new fresh produce that's on top, is just um, the produce under it is just purely just rotten and disgusting. And not to mention all the um, extra things that put it into it in order to keep it ripe when they ship it in those little containers that are horribly managed, um, not up to temperature quality, uh, temperature a lot of times, and which is just culminates into a very disgusting thing that people just don't understand that they're buying. And not to mention um, a lot of scandals when it comes to like the meat section of stores. Uh, where they're making the meat look redder when it's in reality just pretty much rancid meat that people are eating and buying. Um, and then also I want to add a little, one little more things, especially with um, the introduction of fast food in the last 50 years and the quality of that. Um, that is horrible. And there's a lot of, uh, what is it, studies have shown that increases um, I have people mentioning, you know, mental, mental health and decline, uh, especially when it comes to like um, increasing anger and aggression. Um, for just due to not having a proper amount of the vitamins and the things your body needs on a daily basis in order to stay in a good running order, um, especially when it comes to teenagers. Um, they don't eat well at all. <laughs> it's not surprising, but especially the food the school serves them. Um, I've had to do, yeah, I've had to do a couple projects on them. Um, and I found out that um, a good old McDonald's hamburger is healthier than the average school hamburger and a lot of different foods are somehow unhealthier when they're touted to be healthier. So it's creating a lot of just horrible dietary um, problems for a lot of kids, especially just um, not knowing how to properly eat and eat well. Bang when you're up. Well said to June, by the way. Yeah, um, I guess in regards to what uh, Jim said, just uh, first thing is that the lowest kind of uh, food that is dispensed is uh, prison food and school food. And so roughly, I think uh, they, they make the prison food really awful in some cases or jails from what I understand. But g generally, when it comes to grades of meat and other other products to get shipped to these places, um, at least that was the case that I always heard when I was growing up. I know for a fact that when I hear, um, I do hear stories where people are really awakened. When I say awakened, I mean, when I say people, I guess I mean the general public. Like it is pretty widespread that um, people know that we need to eat better, put uh, better, fresher, and local ingredients into our foods. I think they have made a lot of strides since when I when I was growing up. Um, I, I was fortunate to have some pretty access to some pretty good food growing up, fairly consistently, um, most of the time, uh, even in the school setting. And I'm sure that had vastly improved even before then. But um, I do think that if I even hear a, a simple source like. NPR somewhere where people are really acknowledging the importance of good food, fresh food, local um, supply chains from local uh, producers and stuff that I think that because this this is a kind of a situation that only gets solved on the mass level that yeah we can all all of us can obviously do um, this individually and make our own great choices individually but the fact is that people are individually making these choices a a as a marketplace and only then can you get these choices in the supply chains and the you know the the, the suppliers and the the, the know-how and maybe the change in the regulations or getting those regulations off the background to some of these more like legally controversial items because um, there are a lot of controversies with with food and there's a whole long 
story with that. And it's not all just necessarily malicious. Uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, malicious. You know, they're trying to control food and control us by the food. When it comes to some of that stuff, it's a long story with regulation of meats and dairies and stuff that um, they don't even have in, in their in the mindset coming from the early 20th century about uh, people who are going to start doing local supply chains and local productions and farmers markets and stuff. That was uh, the 17th century for them. So, and the fact is mechanized and um, industrial and then in the future beyond that, uh, like genetically uh, modified organisms and stuff was going to be the future. Why would we ever kind of regress back? Well, we've obviously seen the light and I think we're moving in the right direction for that. And I think that society, Hopefully, the successive generations are going to change even more for the better. Yeah, the great altar of progress. Yeah. Um, either it doesn't tell me who, so either Brian or <laughs> Ellen, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, I want to uh, pick up off of like what Dejuma was saying, and I know uh, Ryo uh, wrote about this in his piece a bit as well, and he mentioned in the chat here about B vitamins. Um, I mean. You know, it becomes a question of now, Sec, I know you like to get your hands dirty, and it sounds like most of the people here do as well. Ellen and I are people who like to, too. Um, but there, there does, there, there's this odd issue of like, so the question becomes, okay, well, why don't people like, why aren't they interested in growing their own food or, you know, picking up the organic stuff instead of the processed stuff, right? Um, and, and I think we have like a, a genuine societal level issue of over sanitization. Um, and this, this kind of speaks to the B vitamins. Like, you know, one of the, when, when you decide on either a vegetarian or like vegan diet, one of the quick things that will come up is like, well, how are you going to give vitamin B12? This is essential for humanity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while there are foods that you can certainly get in, you know, like uh, nutritional yeast, Ellen, would you say that's one of them that can provide B12? That's fortified with Fortif B12. So right. it's, it's not naturally occurring. Okay. Yeah. So how do you get B12 when it's not naturally occurring? like in a food itself, you get it because nor like historically the food that we would plant, you know, that we would farm, like we would pull it out of the ground. It still have all that dirt on it. Right. And that's where the actual B12 comes from. Right. That's where like the animals that eat that they get the B12 from. Correct. Right. From bacteria in the dirt and in water. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so like, I appreciate the concern of, you know, doctors and whoever else, Hey, you're not getting enough B12. The problem though, is that um, nobody, like even meat eaters, nobody gets enough B12 right now because we actually like we over sanitize the food that we eat. And there's just like this, there's this mentality that exists where like, oh, everything's got to be clean. Everything's got to be that. And part of that, I think, comes from being removed from the food production process, which is a major problem that a lot of people have been bringing up for, frankly, 100 years. But um I think that's really key to understand that actually like getting your hands dirty, eating food that isn't like overly cleaned and all this stuff is actually a very healthy thing. But again, there's this, you know, and and could is it down to like marketing campaigns, advertising campaigns, where it's like, we got to make the food look appetizing. We can't have it look dirty. But the thing is, if the food's not dirty, we're not getting what we need. You know, we're not getting that vitamin B12 that is absolutely essential. Again, not naturally occurring. You have to fortify it. Um, yeah, uh, Ryo said in the chat, I just want to read it. He said, come on, Brian, they just inject uh, B vitamins into the Beyond Impossible Frankenburger. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't help anything. You know, like it's 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 not, you know, striking the root as, uh, as we anarchists like to say. Um, yeah, bingo. I don't even think it's advertising, though, Brian. Like, mm -hmm. okay, so you don't want the the horrors that come out of the factory farms to be right. unwashed. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, that's disgusting. Yes. It's not like you're just going out in your backyard and, and either picking veggies or slaughtering a chicken. It's not the same thing. Well right? said, so yes. They have to. They have to, like, power wash that stuff coming out of there because the way they produce these things, vegetables or meat, is disgusting because yeah. it, it comes down to volume and mass scale. We've lost, again, we've lost touch with our relationship to food production. Um, so, a, you know, they don't really... If we're going to do it this way, which we probably we obviously shouldn't, but if we're going to do it this way, they have to clean it because it's probably covered in you know man-made horrors beyond our comprehension. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. Um, that it comes back to the problem of mass production again. Um, somebody else had their hand up, and I forgot who. Bj, 
Was that you? Yes. Yeah, that you. Was, Thank that you for doing it again. There no you. problem. <laughs> um, the the Jitsi is a little confusing. I understand. Um, yeah, I just wanted to hop in and just kind of 100% agree with Brian on the over sanitization, over purification. Um, I grew up, you know, we ate mud pies in the backyard on the sandbox and we had scabby knees and we would peck at them and we picked our nose and, you know, we wiped it on the floor and, you know, there's like three generations of people now in, in, in the Western society, I would guess, that are like born in a bubble of Purell. And I mean, we, we were talking, Ray and, and sex lady and I were talking about, you know, chickens and eggs and stuff. And I was like, give me your poopy egg. Um, no, we were just talking about uh, the gals and I on the Let's Make Some Shit podcast. We were talking about this idea that, you know, we do have an over sanitized, over purified society in the last, I would guess, three generations or so of people in the Western, you know, in the United States are probably born in a Purell bubble. And we were talking about how, you know, a lot of us who are a little older grew up in this, in this, you know, with the idea that it's okay to get dirty. It's okay to eat you know, your poopy eggs from the chicken coop and it's okay to have, you know, a little dirt on your food and maybe you flick a bug off it or something as opposed to this really, like Brian was saying, kind of bleached and over sanitized, um, you know, consumption that we have. And not just with food, but like with everything. Everything is antibacterial. Uh, everything is um, very... Uh, it, it's it's almost impossible to have a germ on some things these days, like on purpose. And look at our immunity, our immunities in the toilet, generally speaking, as a society. And I think something that, you know, Shane would probably agree with is um, when I started looking into Pathways to Liberty uh, with my food and producing things, uh, one of the first things I did was making broth, you know, just from straight bones and water. And it healed my gut. And I, the first cold that I got uh, after doing that, it lasted me three days and I was fine. And usually a cold will take me out for about five to six days and I'd have no taste and <laughs> runny nose and all that sore throat. And I haven't had a cold since 2016. I haven't even had a sniffle since then. And I won't take a PCR test. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that all of us radical people are doing and refusing to do. Um, depending on your stance, um, that are, and we're proof, proof is in the pudding that we're, we're healthier for it. So I, I'd agree with the over sanitization of America. Penguin, you had something to add? Yeah, I mean, you hear this so often in our circles too, and it, but it's, um, it is really kind of true. And I think it goes back to the idea of um, whether you're talking about politics or, um, or, uh, economics so I can play understand me plan economy or if it's with the physical world or our health and everything that as you know as time progresses you people make these interventions and I mean you're always doing something it's always some there's some sort of intervention of course if it's ha happening from like the top down or something we don't like that but all these these interventions are made along the way historically with out and this is without the ability to even have the kind of foresight that about what what are the consequences or how what are the how to not even having the ability to evenly weigh the pros and cons of certain things. So you're solving a bunch of problems along the way um, that seem to be the case, and now you end up with a world that's so sterile, like, like that um, BJ mentioned, that we have uh, immune problems or problems you know kind of getting that natural immunity which amazingly is a, a politically charged wor world now, word now of all things natural immunity <laughs> but um and it and it happens with you know a, a essentially plant economies it happens with economics it's like this is the reason act that for for better or for worse that like conservative politics exists because i think people realize the the um practical reality of of, of making like societal wide interventions is that, that down the road you really can't, don't have the ability to predict um and so you end up in a situation where now you have an entire food system that just has like there's always pros and cons to every major change in every intervention and every kind of like central planning that you do at that scale but you all really don't have the ability to see 
50, 100 years down the future where we're all trying to do local production and get our hands dirty and raise our own goats and chickens. I think the idea of that, like 100 years ago, even to somebody who's like raising chickens 100 years ago, to think that 100 years we wouldn't find a way to not have to raise chickens or to, or to grow crops or to like have a farmer's market even somewhere rural where they had a farmer's market and it's like we haven't progressed past that no we've long progressed past that and we've found like advantages and pros and people are generally they're certainly well fed like there's they're certainly getting enough calories people are definitely not dying of starvation which is something that's happened and still happens and is it's dying like the idea of, of starvation people living in abject poverty is having an actual starvation amount of nutrition is going away in the world um but we're left on the, on the leading edge in the united states and like the richest or the most in the most like resource rich country in the world on the other end of things we're have we're dealing with all the negative consequences of that i don't want to just say abundance but like all of these choices and interventions and progress in, in, in square scarecrows um brian and ellen you're next but i know you guys got to leave soon so i'm going to ask you this question and um and this will go to everybody but um in what ways can food be used as a weapon or shield as you guys put it um to to f further our own independence personal autonomy um and self-reliance um, but go ahead and I'll let you guys answer that question. Oh, thanks. Well, that's a great question. Um, and I actually just wanted to pose another question to everybody in the group, but I'll save that for after responding to yours. Um, I think food can be used as a shield, you know, against a lot of health problems that are created by the modern, you know, food industry. Um, you know, some of the biggest killers of humans in the Western world right now are self-inflicted. Uh, you know, coronary heart disease, diabetes, stroke, obesity, uh, chronic inflammation, all these things can be at least altered, if not cured, with a healthy, nutritious diet. Uh, like Penguin was saying, people are being fed, but that doesn't mean that they're getting the nutrition that they need. Um, you know, we're consuming a lot of calories and toxins and additives, but not getting, you know, vitamins and minerals and antioxidants, things that are really essential to a, a healthful existence. Um, and I guess my question, um, which I can save for later, or I can ask it right now. Um, what do you, what do you think, Zach? Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. So my question is, uh, why, why is it, do you think, um, and I'd love to hear from everybody on this, um, that people don't take more of an interest in nutrition when it's something that is so immediate and so important to a person's life? Um, and is it possible that it's sort of a, a cycle where like people are eating unhealthy food that kind of causes them to be more, um, I, I don't know, to, to have less cares, to think about it less, to kind of be more focused on immediate concerns? Um, like the aggression that Dijon mentioned, um, or, you know, is it something that people just don't want to deal with because it's dirty? Uh, it's because it's give me convenience or give me death. So <laughs> it's cheap and it's cheap and easy, right. To just eat fast food or whatever it is. And people are so ground down in the rat race that they don't, they're struggling to get by. They have working two jobs. They got kids at home. They just need yes. to put food on the table. They don't have time to go buy locally source, organic, free range, whatever the thing from their local farmer because the system has ground them into a fine mist. So it's just a matter of convenience. It's easy. It's, it's much harder to eat healthy. Um, and most people just don't have the time or the freaking energy after what working 12 hours. So uh, that would be my opinion on why. And that kind of goes into another, the other side of that, whereas is that also a tool of control to keep people's head down to just make everybody broke and have to work at the rat weight race nonstop? Um, 
but is anybody else want to answer uh, Alan's question? Yeah, I had a um, something that came right out the top of my head, and I also agree with what you just said, Sec. Um, convenience as, as well, but as plus, if you're if you're relatively young and you have no um, presenting symptoms of problems, food is hard to view as medicine. And and if you can get away with eating uh, unhealthily and not even know that you're eating unhealthily because you haven't been presented with anything, you haven't had to go to the doctor and complain about something, um, it is very easy to ignore what you're eating. It is very easy to um, because food is not something that instantaneously affects us as often as we would like to think. Food poisoning is something that you can get within 12 hours or 48 hours, um, depending on what it is you're consuming, uh, you know, whether it's a certain you know, reaction. But also, um, it's something that you have to have over time, the exposure of it. And I was 34 years old until... Uh, I had a lot of problems that just literally kind of hit me all at once, like in the in a few months. And I was sitting down to a, a shoebox size basket of um, prescription pills. And that was one of the days that I was um, very clear, clear on this is not normal for me. This is not normal for someone who is under 50 to be on this much meds. Even people who are 50 shouldn't be on this much meds. And so I think this whole idea that there's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation as what constitutes healthy. There's a lot of people that under that think they're under they're under the uh, apprehension that they're eating healthy when they aren't. Um, there's a lot of marketing that feeds into that and government and corporate control. But also, um, I think if you could take your local community and do things like Keith is doing or do things like SEC and his family is doing and just helping find, helping feed others and showing them the ways uh, towards healthier um, eating. Um, my particular, uh, we have a local Agora here in the Twin Cities that it's a market that we hold periodically and people just bring their own foods that they've made. And this group is very adamant about glyphosate and additional sugars and things like that. So it's been very helpful. Thank you. Right on. Well said. Yeah, I was coming back to you guys because I know you got to go. Brian uh, and Ellen, you, um, anything else you guys want to say in case you got to skedaddle? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it plays well with Ellen's question, which I look forward to uh, when this goes live, uh, to, to hearing everyone else, any other responses to that. But also to answer your question for myself, Sec, um, about you know how can we use it as a shield? Uh, I mean, I think a, a pretty key thing to there is not like when we talk about this, we say, well, why do we do GMOs? Because look, there are people starving. Why do we you know why do we do this with food? Why do we produce this? Why do we do this so much with corn? Well, people are starving, and we need to make like cheap food for them to be able to get. They got to get their dollar hamburger if it's still a dollar. I don't know at McDonald's, you know, whatever. Um, but you see, the problem is that that's actually not true. There is not a food shortage. There might be a healthy food shortage. I could believe that, but there's not a food shortage in general. There's a distribution problem. And that distribution problem completely comes from government regulations around the world. Um, and so one of the, th you know, just a really important thing to do is to, you know, get that stuff, get that deregulated, get those laws out of the way of feeding people and then maybe when their stomach's full, they can think about what kind of food they actually want to eat. And then they can think about, you know, like doing things like gardening, which are genuinely important, useful, and valid tools for one's own health um, and for getting out from underneath authoritarianism, like I said earlier. Um, so, it because, and, you know, and here's the other part too, like, I agree, I'd rather people eat healthily, but also I know that that takes time. Like, like I was talking about earlier with like the low fat diet, that finally falling away. Um, it takes time. It, this is a generational thing, you know, for people to finally like perhaps get into gardening in their backyard or, you know, demanding that they're from whatever corporations, hopefully those go away too, but demanding from the, the food sources that the food is healthy, you know, uh, it's going to take time to get there. And so if we could even just start with, deregulating, you know, all of this nonsense that keeps food from continually going forward, you know, like say hot food at a restaurant. There's no reason that that shouldn't be going to, you know, eventually to, to homeless shelters or whatever else. Um, 
I, I think we'd be a lot better off there. And then people could also, you know, just think, because again, they'd at least have a full stomach. It might not be the healthiest just yet. We'll get there. Um, but I do think that a lot of what we're talking about is going to be a generational game. Uh, but that's the importance of doing podcasts like this to get people at least started thinking about it. Do you want to answer Ellen's questions as well? Or you kind of did, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's it. It's just people are hungry, you know, and yeah. and also, you know, they're surrounded by, I mean, this goes well beyond food. They're surrounded by distraction. Uh, they're sur I mean, they're just constantly distracted. Like we're, we're living in an attention wars as much as we're living in a health wars. Um, and they really, you know, like they can't think about it. In fact, honestly, most people, and hey, look, Ellen and I do this too. We'll watch a TV show or a movie while we're, you know, eating at times. Um, you know, most people don't even like they're not even paying attention to what they're putting into their mouth because they're just nonstop surrounded by screens or, you know, whatever else that it that it happens to be. So to some degree, they don't care. Even if it did taste like shit, they wouldn't know because <laughs> they're not paying attention to what they're even, you know, really putting into their mouths. Um, so I think a lot of people, you know, they're just they're going for that quick fix in a very attention uh, uh, starved uh, or not starved, but attention deficit society that we live in. Um, I, th I think that's that's a major part of it. So this is this is a very holistic thing. You know, diet is so core, but that's the thing. It's so core. It speaks to everything. Um, you know, mentality, physicality. You know, the whole business. So, yeah, bread and circuses. There you go. I saw that in the chat. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my answer. Is that people are just they're completely distracted from this. You know, from from even caring. Yeah, I pretty much agree with that. And um, if you guys do end up having a skedaddle, um, thanks for coming on. Your in, both your input was invaluable in this conversation, so I'm glad to. Thanks for having us. Both. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, honored to be here. Honored to stay as long as you want. I'm not kicking you out, but I'm just. Oh I'm, no worries. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go ahead and bow out. But uh, it was an honor to speak with with so many brilliant people and be on this. Uh, we you know thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to hearing the rest of it. Um, you know when it goes live. Awesome. You guys want to plug something? Yeah, of course. Uh, just go to SovereignTech.com to hit up the podcast and you can go to, uh, Ellen, do you want to say Sovereign.Substack.com? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go to Sovereign.Substack.com to check out the newsletter that Brian and I write every two weeks. Which covers diet and health a lot. So, you know, if this is a subject you're interested in, that newsletter is going to hook you up. Right on. That, Thanks, guys, for coming right on. on. You guys have yeah. yourselves a good weekend. Thank Same you everyone. so much. Thank you. Peace. Peace. Okay, who was up next? Penguin, you had something to say? Yeah, what you said earlier was really um, inspiring, and I think um, I totally, I totally agree in general for society and for myself. Totally understand that we are too busy in what you call the rat race, and yeah, it's basically our careers and our, you know, earning an income in the cash economy and just trying to pay our bills pay our you know mortgage or trying to uh make our way in life or if you're doing a career or if you're doing a small business i mean it but it's, it's also basically survival and that kind of precarity mindset where we got to work a full-time job with a full-time schedule and of course you know i don't want to sound like a trad but you know we're, we're having the um ha having uh, both parents in a, in a family in the workforce or if it's a larger family unit having multiple people in the workforce and not having anybody to um kind of do those things because it does take it's it just a matter of reality that it takes labor hours to do these um what i'll what i'll call raleigh homestead things which is going to be as simple as like you know it could be raising chickens it could be doing a garden it, but it could also be just be like taking fresh foods and i don't know doing some canning and and uh, food preparation and food storage and stuff, but all these sorts of things plus other things that we kind of are inclusive of or a step beyond, you know, household chores. But what would have been, I guess, in a previous age, but basically, like over time, we were outsourcing all these things. Well, this is we're also outsourcing food production, food storage, and like the family level food processing. But that, the the fact is, like, I, I'm not going to make a statement about whether you know what policy gender policy should be a workforce or or if there should be a, a family oriented work welfare state to have women stay at home i don't know what the solution is i probably wouldn't suggest that but it is the fact is that late that source of labor that's necessary for doing all these things when when, when you have a family unit 
or like the um, nuclear family where two parents working in the cash economy, that labor is being set out outwards and it's be, and something critical is being lost there. Keith, man, you've been around a long time. What do you, what do you got to say about all this? Well, you know, I grew food uh, in Taos, New Mexico for 15 years and um, the environment there changed so dramatically it became really, um, you know, we had a ton of food in October and November, like um, January, February, no matter how much we tried to preserve, you couldn't have lived on it. You definitely needed livestock, which is, even though I'm a vegan, to survive winters at 7,000 feet, that became pretty obviously important. Now, the other thing is though, I, I mean, the discussion so far, most people that I know have no place to even grow any food, you know. Um, in the homeless camp here in Santa Cruz, there are some organic gardens that have been put there, but they've been, they get destroyed by the city relatively quickly. And I think a ton of the people, sadly, have no idea about that there even is a concept of healthy food that, you know, they go, you know, their range and ability to get food is limited to 7-Elevens and, um, you know, local gas stations. And if they're lucky, there might be like a Safeway or some kind of thing that they can actually get to. So there's a there's a ton of limitations, and I and I do get the sense from, you know, many many people have no idea that there's even a concept of of food being healthy or at any nature. There's just assumption because they see it on TV, they see billboards everywhere, they smell the, you know, fries from a local McDonald's, whatever it is. That's that's just their entire world is is like that, and they have no idea how it's impacted their health or whatever impact their health and i and i'm partially i i do think that that is um part of a strategy now i i spoke at the um occupy the world uh, food prize event in des moines iowa a few years back obama was president and the state department uh official for agriculture was the keynote speaker at that so at the um official World Food Prize event. We were the protests outside. And they have three things that they were uh, pushing the US State Department. And one was genetically modified um, uh, soy and corn particularly, and the patenting of, uh, of life because they were trying to promote the idea that that was the way to feed the world. Um, and uh, the other is that the, you know, the uh, Food, the feedlot, the all the feedlots, which is where that corn and soy was going, is um, all hooked up with a, 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 a very dramatically uh, well organized economic system, and um, in which at that time they were trying to push the the, um, uh, the oh no, a trade agreement with Asia, I guess, is part of what the or the TTP or I forget even which trade agreement of the WTO that they were trying to push. But the but that the, what I basically am saying is that there's an integration between banking and uh, and farming and distribution of food. And the thing that hit me the most was I was in uh, when I was at the University of Missouri, the head of the sustainable agriculture department um, asked me what MU stand for. And he and I thought, well Missouri University he goes, oh no, Monsanto University. And he explained that the Farm Bureau of Missouri had voted every year against genetically modified crops, but all of, all of them were growing them. And he explained why. So if you want to have a, a $2 million combine, you've got to get a mortgage for that. You have to prove that your soy is going to go to a feedlot that's already ready to buy it. And that feedlot also has to have a customer uh, um for their, their livestock, then their livestock, uh, their cus that customer has to have a customer for the distribution of the food, whether it's a grocery or a restaurant outlet. And the banks won't lend farmers money unless they all that's happening. And it goes into they can't buy the, you know, they you can't get a loan to buy organic 
soy in an amount if that's what you're trying to do for because you're thinking you're going to buy make uh, tofu products or soy products that are organic um so there, there's a whole linking between global capital and food production which i think is part of really the war on food that is has to be somehow decoupled and sadly, I think that that decoupling is actually going the opposite direction in a really dramatic way, and that we're going into a future where there's be even less and less food producers, uh, less corporations will control it, less banks will control it, unless the society completely collapses, which is certainly a possibility. Um, and therefore, it's going to be really crazy trying to make sure people are able to eat. I think also the world, uh, I think that the studies show that a majority of the food, out, even so, is actually um, grown by women on sustainable farms. So most people in the world are, are surviving basically by small farms that are essentially um, um, run by, by women in, in sustainable, um, you know, in the third world particularly, like in, in Philippines and Asia and Africa and so on. So actually these mega food corporations are not responsible for a bulk of the world's food. And then finally, I would say, that, you know, I, when I wrote the book, The Anarchist Cookbook, one of the aspects I wanted to show was that most commonly people, particularly when I started Food Not Bombs 42 years ago, this, and I was influenced by the um, by Francis Moore LePay and Diet for a Small Planet, the um, you know, this that, that only droughts and and um, things like that were locusts infestations and so on were responsible for hunger. But we can see all the way back to the fall of Rome that it was actually economic policies that caused hunger in Rome and helped influence the um, collapse of that that society. And it wasn't inability to grow food; it was the economic and political system that made it impossible. And, we, and the the most co famous one, of course, is the um, potato, so-called potato famine in Ireland, where huge amounts of the food was being exported to England while people were starving. And there was like a whole Protestant Catholic manipulation of food where Protestant churches would only feed you if you converted to them and this kind of political manipulation there. And there, and there was a, the potato blight only affected one, uh, you know, mostly the lumper and not other parts of agriculture, um, it was, you know, so that famine. And then I think if we moved to a, a more recent famines, uh, the one uh, where the movie Black, uh, Black Hawk Down in Somalia in that event, it was three tons of fresh food was exported from Somalia for every ton of food aid imported to handle that uh, famine. And I think that's generally um, throughout history and my research for that book has been the case that the the real issue, for example, uh, and then one last thing I'll say is in Ethiopia, um, when I was spent I spent some time there, there's these mega farms in Ethiopia with uh, state of the art um, greenhouses growing amazing amounts of food, but that food was actually controlled, and a lot of it was flowers actually, uh, tulips was controlled by the Netherlands. And it was exported mostly uh, to the to Europe, and the other food that was uh, being grown in Ethiopia was being grown by the Chinese, and that food was being exported to to China, but also to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So people were, there are 25 million people facing uh, hunger in Ethiopia while there's tons of food, and it was all it was largely being exported out of the country. And so I think this manipulation that occurs. Um, could be really stark here in the United States if there is a rather intense social unrest occurring with a collapsing economy. And I um, would like to note that there's 3.8 million households in the United States that have told the U.S. Census Bureau, or this is extrapolated from their study, that they will be uh, evicted in October. And so those people moving to the streets have no way to store food. Um, you know, they have no way to refrigerate food. They have, they are dependent on soup kitchens or shoplifting, things like that. And uh, and, I, and there's an ever larger, larger number of Americans who are basically 
in food deserts and they could eat maybe get tons and tons of calories but virtually no nutrition and they're essentially just like uh, patel said in his book uh, much starved and and stuffed i think that might be his name of his book he wrote some nice blurb from my second second book get the name of his title but that we are starving uh, many many poor people are basically starving although they're overweight and have access to lots of calories but very little access to actual nutrients so anyway that would be what I got to say there, so I don't take well, Keith, let, let me ask you. No, well, I yeah. got you. Uh, what what solutions do you think we have available to either combat this uh, or better ourselves or um, change the material conditions for people on the ground? Wow. Well, you know, my my strategy so far, and I think a lot of people in Food Not Bombs in general strategy, has been to just create an autonomous community outside the st the system that exists as much as possible but i uh and then and hooking up with people that grow food to get uh, food distributed but it is huge huge problem i mean i had only an acre of land in taos and we uh you know the season's very short there that's a lot, a lot of the problem and even with a giant uh, greenhouse it was still pretty slow work um the uh you know and i have a you know we have a garden in the back of the place i'm staying right now but you know, it's definitely not enough. So to feed people, growing food is hard, and growing it successfully is in enough to have uh, surplus is really hard. So I I have not uh, much of a you know I creating our own autonomous uh, communities is going to be important. And I do think of um, the food short. You know, it's a possibility of feeding everyone, but the political and economic system has to be so radically changed to make that the priority as opposed to um, hoarding food and, and, and all that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hardcore. Uh, so changing the entire political system is going to be very difficult. And, but that definitely, that political and economic system does need to be dramatically changed. And I'm, and I think it needs to, to me, I would want, it needs to happen really, really quickly, but I don't think people are educated or, ready or have the responsibility necessary to to certainly do that society wide at this point so i you know maybe just small numbers of us in setting up our own networks with you know neighbors who do grow food and people that do have access to land and all that um you know it's going to be the short-term solution for small numbers of us but that's the in, in the industrial world, I don't know. You know, right now in, in Europe, of course, they're just, they have a ma major policy to um, to turn farmland over to uh, um, to large transnational corporations or to um, um, basically, uh, well, you know, I know for instance, in the Netherlands, they're trying to reduce the amount of total farms by something in the area of 30%. And yet that's the second largest exporter of food in the world. And there, you see this across Canada, even as uh, discussing uh, reducing farming dramatically. And it's not clear why governments uh, and why this has become a global issue that producing less food is seems to be uh, something really important to transnational corporate power. But there definitely are policies like that happening across the world. and. Um, and it's a, you know, you could see huge farmer uprisings around the world. Uh, the most famous, of course, recently was the Indian farm, farmers uprising in New Delhi. But you have like a total revolt now in the Netherlands. You've had similar things that are starting up in Italy and Germany. And um, so farmers are starting to try to create a global network to fight back against this new um, agenda to, to reduce agriculture. Keith, do you have to run or are you sticking around for a bit? Um, I'm going to have to leave here shortly because I'm almost out of electricity at this point. Okay. Yeah. Um, before um, before you go, do you want, do you want to uh, plug anything that you have? Yeah. So, uh, well, um, you know, my latest book is the uh, um, Anarchist Cookbook. And then it does talk about that. That's not so 
and I am about to finish another book, which doesn't really have a name, although the working title right now is called Soup Street. And Food Not Bombs itself is got a global Zoom meeting tomorrow uh, at 9 um, Civic Standard Time. And um, you could email me, Keith, at foodnotbombs.net. And uh, the level of, of hunger and desperation on the streets of the world, let alone in the United States, is growing rapidly. And um, so we can use as much support if you can connect and divert food to local Food Not Bombs chapters in your neighborhood. Um, or to volunteer with Food Not Bombs um, would be super helpful. And, um, and, and I think that's the, one of the entryways to maintaining at least some ability to have some people eating in communities is to gather together in groups like Food Not Bombs, um, you know, Homes Not, you know, Food Not Lawns, things like that. And um, and try to work and network together. I think the survivalist idea of storing thousands of cans of food in a, your basement and buying the AR-15 is really a very short-term solution to surviving um, uh, the rocky future that we're likely to have at this point. So uh, that would be my main main points of foodnutbombs.net. And thanks so much for having me. And uh, such a great topic. And it's so interesting, the diversity of speakers and their uh, backgrounds and uh, their influences. It's quite impressive. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much for coming on. We really appreciate your, your input here. And it's always a pleasure talking to you. And um, I appreciate all you do. So take thanks. care, man. Thanks. Yeah, we're going to go back out Thank on the you. street and fight. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you, brother. Peace. Bye-bye. All right, uh, who's up next? Um, how can we, did anybody not answer Ellen's question that would like to? Ray, go for it. I'll say the Zoom, go for it. Okay, Ray first. Um, so I think her question was, it's been a while since she asked it. What, it's why. why. Yeah, why people aren't taking this initiative to improve their health and their food security. Mm -hmm. um and i i think it comes and I, to, I totally agree with what everybody else has said so far and their insight has been um, really great um i think it comes down to a level of ignorance addiction and arrogance maybe maybe like an ignorance and unwillingness to take that step in that personal responsibility and I think, you know, the internet really overcomplicates skills these days. And I know that's something that Resonance and I have been trying to do with our podcast. It's just kind of, you know, kind of break things down. And so people don't get hung up on details. I know I do. And I imagine there's probably a lot of other people out there. And because there has been such an uptick in people, you know, wanting to take their health into their own hands. Um, and I would say, as an addict, I kind of recognize it. And I feel like there's a lot more food addiction than maybe people realize. I've seen firsthand people with like actual food addiction and it, it was pretty eye opening to me. But even on, you know, an everyday level, the everyday person, I, I feel like in, maybe it's even just the habit, the addiction to the ha habit, but you know, habits are so hard for people to break, especially if they have been broken down by society or the rat race or their jobs, you know, it's like uh, people don't want to put that extra effort in, into learning that new skill. And a lot of people growing up were very pampered, you know, and didn't go without and maybe, maybe lack the basic skills of cooking, you know? Um, and I think also to make those changes, people have to admit that they eat like shit or, you know, live a very unhealthy lifestyle. And I know it was hard for me to admit it, you know, back in the day, but just to kind of be like, okay, this is a problem. I think so many people are kind of blind and just think that, or take their health for granted, you know, and don't have any desire to make those changes. Uh, Dejum, you're up next, and then BJ. Okay, so I'm just gonna, um, just gonna speak on a little couple of different things that people have said in the past uh, on this topic, uh, especially what um, Ellen brought up earlier. I remember her name correctly. I'm horrible with names. Um, 
is mostly not being able to that also uh, Rayo meant put it into the text chat is the ability to use your property or to have any property at all or the expense of being able to start um, producing your own food for either sustainably for your family, yourself, um, or even to help out your community. Um, it's it's really just hard for some a lot of people in the rat race of kind of the middle class and the kind of lower poor class, you could say, um, especially they're not being able to fund themselves, um, not being able to even buy their proper food as they a lot of times have to spend more uh, money on being able, being able to keep their house afloat and their bills, and as people have mentioned before, and they'll just choose the cheapest chip bag, the cheapest amount of meat, cheapest fruits, or even part of that is people not caring about their food is they're seeing um, kind of the obsession with material social status um, of can I get this new uh, this new car, this new clothes, the new the new TV, this new um, streamable thing, so on and so forth, kind of the obsession of the consumer of getting that new thing, um, the new fad, the new technology, and just not focusing on our health, ultimately. Um, and then especially, uh, people have mentioned the rat race, um, and I could say from a little bit kind of where I am from, um, we're a very oil-dominated town, so a very large wealth gap here, not too much of the middle class, as it's just rich, or it's just you're in a trailer and you're pretty much poor and these guys work now uh, people employed in the oil field are working six days a week uh, working almost 10 hour shifts or sometimes even working two weeks straight 24 hours straight um, it's insane and it's really just hurting them ultimately because they have no attention to put to their health and what they're putting in their body yeah all good points uh bj right Peter. Yeah, I was just going to expound a little bit on what Ray said and the Um I agree that there's a lot of misinformation. I think Ray was talking about how people really just don't know um, how to source food or like even what they're eating. And then um, the Joom talking about, you know, people prioritizing different things in their lives. It becomes a problem because I, as a personal um, case, I mean, I uh, am a I'm a struggling food addict um, and former addict, but um, I think people by and large, like just the average person, if you ask them what they think is healthy, they don't know, or they think they know based on information that they're getting from horrible sources. Um, the internet is pervasive with misinformation. There's, oh, you know, eggs are bad for you. And then the next day eggs are good for you. So who can rely on this information? Nobody. Um, there's also a lot of, um, the thing that I was trying to bring up as a personal story was, um, I didn't know that I was unhealthy until I had some medical problems. So until people actually, like people do take their health for granted, like Dejun was saying, and if you don't have a problem and you're just like, you're living your life and you're doing your thing, then why would it be a problem? If it doesn't present a problem, then you have no way of knowing that it's a problem. And so there's, it's not just ignorance, but just this is what the rest of the world is doing, you know, so. Uh, did you just put in the chat, uh, I forgot to mention that a lot of times food addiction can exist because the individual is using it as a coping mechanism for mental and emotional problems. 100%. And, and as a former emotional eater, it's a circle. So if you're using food as a way to comfort yourself or you had a bad day or you're having a great day, um, which is what I did, um, that's how you can abuse yourself and make yourself worse. I was following nutritional guidelines for the most part. I mean, on the weekends, you have beer and pizza with your friends, whatever, right? But for the most part, I was following what mainstream information was telling us was quote unquote healthy. And yet my peers were eating the same things as me. And I was the one that was fat and it was, and sick. So. Penguin, you had something. Yeah. Um, I think that goes back to what I was saying. This has been mentioned several times um, about the link. Uh, I would, yeah. Uh, Jim keeps mentioning it a bunch. And yeah, do we have 
are discovering. We have discovered for, it's probably been a couple of decades, but um, it's probably been longer than that, but very slowly discovering the uh, effects of like diet and the gut and gut composition. Basically it's like gut bacteria. And I guess the resulting chemical composition of the, like the stomach and intestines and everything. And it's effect on um, everything else. So mental states, mental health, emotions. I mean, just, and then I guess all the interconnectivity of all the organs and all the organ systems in the body that we just didn't know. So again, it's something that we did not even understand to be able to even use as information inputs when we made decisions in the past and how that is affecting us now. Like, yeah, they were, so in the past we did face problems. It was not overlooked. There was malnutrition, starvation, you know, lack of food or lack of ability to distribute the food properly. Also, a lot of food is perishable, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's major like basic issues. And then how that how that solved. Um, and we have solved that effectively again and again and again. It's been certainly a learning process and a process, excuse me, a process that has um, like generated a lot of information along the way. So hopefully we can do it faster and faster, faster as time goes on. But over time, because there's always like entrenched power and in, in, you know, concentrated interest and involving government and state and everything, that, is that we make these interventions that down the road have negative consequences that are often so far beyond the ability to understand what those would be, because we didn't even have the knowledge about the interplay with all these um, organ systems. I and mean, there was obviously just more direct material concerns involved as far as like, you know, emphasizing grains, emphasizing sugar and de-emphasizing fats and so on. So again, we have to be very careful. And it's one of those places where I certainly do think you should do your own research because the, the information is actually out there in a way where I don't think there's a lot of harm or a lot of competing information or anything. I mean, people really, People have really kind of figured it out. I mean, it's been enough fed diets and enough, you know, this food was good for you, this food is bad for you, and so on and so on, that people have really given up and whittled down to basically the correct information. So, yeah, eat your fats, eat your proteins, get your macros, and obviously you want to eat clean and organic. And, you know, we've, we've kind of at least, at the very least, if you're aware of these things and you have the time just to even in the mental energy just to think about these things and you can emotionally get yourself in a state to to do this make these changes and, th and think about these things like we the information is pretty pretty clear unless you want to go into real specifics or um yeah you know a, a deeper level of detail like we know what to do. We're all basically on the same page here. Obviously, there's meat and, and vegan and vegetarian diets and stuff like that. But when it comes to what the bad trends have been and what what they probably ought to be rectified, in what direction they should often be, you know, rectified, we pretty much have a pretty good idea. Like a lot of people emphasizing fats, like I said, de-emphasizing sugars and you know, complex carbs and stuff. Uh, Rail, you got uh, something to add here? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So I think uh, um, Keith mentioned uh, he was talking about, um, I guess, the farmland being reduced, and I'll just add an, an I guess, an anecdotal example from an, I've noticed uh, in this kind of general area. Um, but yeah, many farms around here are actually being converted to uh, massive solar panel fields. Which, um, I mean, I guess that's better for, or I guess it's better than corn for fuel in terms of the environment because I don't think they're going to spray the solar panels with like. Um, anti -fung and you know antifungals from a plane so um, I think that's probably a benefit even though it's still scammy um, definitely still scammy but um, I guess I could reply to the the, the couple of questions that were, were posited um, and I don't really have anything additional um, to, to why don't people take more of an interest in nutrition um, it's just yeah I mean it's largely just largely time um, you know uh, taking the time to actually you know learn like what's healthy and then um, you know once you learn like what's healthy and you go to the grocery store and you realize like well no, no that's really healthy um, it's kind of overwhelming. So it's a lot easier just to forget about it and not, not worry about it. Um, and I guess uh, um, it's been, I guess, yeah, I've cooked like 99% of my own meals at home for the past um, three years. And uh, I usually end up spending like an hour or two in the kitchen. So yeah, Sek was talking about, you know, people just, you know, people don't have time with their, you know, their lifestyles. And yeah, I mean, it takes time, but uh, 
um yeah it, it definitely definitely takes time to but but i yeah it's but i think it's definitely worth it um because you know harking back to that first question um in what ways uh, you know has food been used as a, a way to shield you know as a shield to further our, our own independence well um i mean uh, you know putting that investment and time and you know effort into um, you know the highest quality food that we can we can produce for ourselves um yeah we can we can drastically improve our health and well-being and um, I know when I when I started eating clean, I you know I got like I, my, my a lot of mental clarity, a lot of you know I, you know a lot of physical, um, yeah, physical well being. I I I was I was definitely I didn't realize it because um, you you kind of get you kind of get you get uh, you know um, caught in this baseline and you don't realize that like you don't feel as good as you as you should. Um, and uh, once you start to make some changes, or even just you know what a, 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 a my, like, you know just like a you know a minor kind of diet change, or you know I guess not really minor because it's not it's not easy to do. Um, you know once you make a diet a lifestyle change and realize oh wow I've actually felt like crap for you know, 15, 20 years and I just didn't really realize it. Um, so um, I guess there's uh, um, yeah it's uh, I, I was definitely impeded for for years though without really knowing. So um, that's the, the 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 biggest thing is we can, we can use food to drastically improve our health and well being. Um, obviously as we talked about. Uh, throughout this discussion, we can use it to reduce our dependence upon the survival society. Um, and, uh, you know, something I see as, you know, um, on the homestead is, you know, there's there's lots of, path, you know, lots of potential paths towards, um, you know, you know, side income and, and financial independence. So um, that's a really, really, really great angle, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess that's what I'd, have, what I'd have to add. Let me just jump in here and one and add one thing uh, from a slightly different angle. And I. Um, I haven't heard this particular perspective, although I've made this point before, but we'll never be free if we allow, speaking from a strategic standpoint, we'll never be free if we allow our enemies to produce our basic necessities for us, right? So you have to almost think of this in terms of <clears throat> long-term strategic warfare. So if if the enemy you're fighting in this in this case it would be the state is producing your your food your water your electricity your medicine the things that you need to serve basic survival um, if those things are being controlled by those who would uh wish to control you or do you harm then there's n you're never going to we're i don't care how many weapons we have i don't care how much bitcoin you mine I don't care how much silver you stack. We're if they control our food, none of that none of that matters. If they can starve you and your family, you will do whatever they you're told. And I'm 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 absolutely the same. I would do anything to protect my kids. If it came down to feeding my kids or not, I mean, mo any parent is going to do do what they have to to, to serve for the survival of their children. So the answer for that is to not allow those people to be the sole controller of food production to uh, if you can gain whatever control over food production you possibly can, you, we are much better off. Then after once that's taken care of, then we can start worrying about, you know, uh, printing weapons and Bitcoin and, and whatever else. But um, speaking from a strategic uh, uh, um, the angle of strategic warfare we have to these are things that we have to control if we ever wish to be free so um who hasn't answered um i'm losing track and i'm getting tired and i'm old so who um who has not answered the how do we use food as a weapon for independence someone penguin go for it yeah i guess in regards, that's a basic fundamental question for this thing. And best thing I can think of is it's if you think of a pyramid, like a, a pyramid of hierarchies of, oh, I said hierarchies, but in the sense of the hierarchies of needs, or in this case, the hierarchy of, you know, importance of different things that we need to focus on materially. Um, as far as, I don't want to say our praxis, but in the sense of liberation, um, the ultimate liberation, you'll have to be I mean, it's basically the actual Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is um, food and basic sustenance are at the bottom. Well, it's also at the bottom for liberation or for a community or however you want to look at that. So, I mean, it's the first step I think we need to talk to. So it's no, 
it's not just out of like personal preference that we talk about this on the pod and a lot of our friends want to talk about that. I mean, it's the basic, it's the unspoken kind of rule that it's the first thing we take into our own hands. Um, as individuals, obviously we're talking about that in the form of a diet, but as, uh, excuse me, as communities, you know, um, producing the food, distributing the food and so on is crucial. And it's something that, how, how do I say this? It's something that there is a strong basis for already in our society. So this is kind of like the idea where an anarchist friend of ours has um, really made the whole kind of direction our podcast originally went in to make sense. So she called the, uh, like Carl has his ideas, essentially framed them as white market agorism. And I was like, wow, because I was wondering how does, uh, did a whole podcast on this. How does um, uh, uh, Cass's ideas kind of interface with um, with agorism and Konkin's ideas? And anyway, I didn't. I personally said not do very well, but it's basically just white market agorism. But anyways, without going on that tangent, um, there's it's just something that people do. It's an everyday activity. It's gardening. I mean, it's eating obviously is an everyday activity, but also gardening and uh, planting and, har and harvesting your own food. That's something that's becoming ever more and more popular, but it's never really gone away. And it's, it's maybe it just changes in the scale and the popularity and the significance. And I think it's waxed and waned in its significance in society as far as actually producing food to eat in, you know, a meaningful amount versus as a hobby or to grow, you know, flowers for more aesthetic purposes or for pollinators and whatnot. But uh, I think we're at a point where, yeah, people are definitely into planting it, um, gardens, it being crucial and important skill to cultivate and understand and to pass down from generation to generation. Um, and there's garden centers everywhere and it's just the, the materials and the um, know-how are readily available for that reason. So I think that it's always going to be our step one, because we're saying if you have as much as just some like planters or a room for a couple of raised beds, you have the space to do some gardening and you have access to gardening materials and a garden center and seeds. So, um, yeah, I think that it's step one and the, the mindset and the skills that you cultivate by taking that first basic step can then be, it's a good baby step if you're not doing it to apply towards uh, other, you know, material aspects of liberation. Yeah, very well said, man. Um, does anybody else want to answer that question? I'm losing track of who has not answered it. Ray, did you answer? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, but I guess I'll just say, simply that every dollar that you can not put into the corporate system by growing your own food, raising your own meat, making your own medicine, you know, is a win for your personal liberty. And, you know, learning a, a skill at a time is invaluable because you're definitely not going to have that time if shit ever does hit the fan or you're in a situation, you know, you know, it's just going to be impossible to learn what you need to know in that moment. So anything that you can do to prepare and not even just to prepare for that moment, but be, to live a freer life out of the system is worth it. And I would say that that's a shield. Yeah, for sure. Um, did you, did you answer that question? I can't remember. Uh, I do not think so, but I, I don't have too much to add because a lot of uh, what other people have said is pretty much what I would say and agree with. But I think also a lot of people haven't really um, started to kind of start being connected with their community or starting to help their community almost just because of kind of, especially in the West, of just this mindset of very the, um, the obsession of the individual and being able to... Um, satisfy your own needs without anybody's help and if you don't i don't need the community and blah 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 um and and it's perfectly fine for you to be in your own um to be your own individual and be able to you know um satisfy your needs and wants but at the same time you do need community in order to um as ray was just saying if you um go and get in a bad 
get in a bad spot and you're not able to provide for yourself anymore, you need to have those people around you to help you um, keep afloat. And that's kind of pretty much my two cents on that. Yeah, I would definitely agree that um, community outreach and um, food, food distribution are, are very crucial to set up now. Um, even things like what Keith McHenry is doing with Food Not Bombs, and um, I've got some stuff for for some some hungry uh, uh, outreach to hungry people going on as well. But the more we can set up those systems up now and sort of strong community bonds and just help out those in need near us, um, the more this is going to be helpful to have strong communities to rely on in the event that there is some sort of economic collapse or, I don't know, uh, supply chains or, or food crises throughout the world. Um, you know, if we have a, a sort of uh, mutual aid system set up now, um, that that will be less harsh on all of us <laughs> in the event that one of these things um, comes uh, comes in the, the future. Um, so I, I agree with the community bonds as being the a very crucial aspect to this. Um, BJ, you had something? Yeah, so I just wanted to point out that a lot of people have answered the question by saying that yeah, there's a lot of information on the internet. There's a lot of people in, in you know, IRL sections of your life that, you know, are probably helpful. But I wanted to point out that um, if, if this is something that SEC brings up sometimes in past episodes, that every time you use food or get food or grow food or cook food, you're making a political decision, whether you're political or not. And so this idea that um, you're not political, but you're still eating what we've been told to eat um, for years, you're, 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 you're basically, it's counter counterintuitive. It's counterproductive to your whole um, identity. And it sounds like an insult. I'm not making an insult. This is, for people that like me who've only just, you know, come to Liberty in the last few years. So I just wanted to add a resource um, that I personally use and it is made for, it is made by anarchists, uh, farmmatch.com. If people aren't using it, it is a growing uh, website. It's sort of like a Craigslist for finding your own farmer that's, you know, within a certain distance to you. And most of these farmers that I, at least in my area, all the farmers that I have access to have pledged to be um, basically anti-mainstream food and, and that you have to sign a membership agreement. And most of the membership agreement verbiage is, I demand healthy, nutritious food that is not controlled by the state, that is not contaminated, and that is grown by people who basically don't like the state and will ignore it. And we grow food and we don't care what the state says. And then you buy this from them and they have drop sites or they have some sort of shipping method. And it's relatively affordable. I'm getting grass-fed beef between $5.50 and $7 a pound, depending on the week. I'm getting raw milk if I want it. I'm getting all kinds of stuff that I would not be able to get at a grocery store. And I live in a city, even though it's pretty quiet where I live. I live in a city and I don't drive so because I'm super urban and just never got around to driving. So I'm stunted that way. But anyway, it's something to look into. Um, if you haven't already, uh, Max Kane and Joseph Ackland are the people that I um, found it through. So and my local freedom. So nice. Uh, Rayo, you had something to say? Yep, just just real quickly, um, just a couple more resources like that. Uh, realmilk.com, they've got a directory for raw milk if you want to find a raw milk pr uh, provider in your area um, for for raw milk or for uh, fermentation. And then uh, also just uh, if you ever need it, uh, findaspring.com. Um, if you're uh, trying to get, uh, you know, if, if uh, you want to, if you've, all you've got access to is tap water and distilled water, something you want some really, really high quality spring water, you can um, find a, find something there. So I'll just toss those out there. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, we have three spring springs like within five miles of us. It's fucking awesome. Nice, dude. Yeah, yeah no, we go there all the time. Uh, not that we drink top water either way, but just if we're going that way, we're filling up jugs of spring water. So, um, does anyone else have anything to add? Um, the open floor. Anybody can say whatever. 
we do have to wrap this up for too long, but nothing. Be excellent to each other. No, there is that. I was going to say that anyway, but all right, well, let's, um, let's wrap it up. It's been a pleasure and you guys have had just amazing insights and I appreciate y'all coming on. Um, I do have to go put the baby to bed, but, um, if you guys want to do a round of plugs, this would be, um, this would be the time to do it. Uh, Ray, why don't you plug, um, Ray O, uh, why don't you plug what you, uh, what you're working on? Sure. So, um, uh, vaniapodcast.com for podcasts on, uh, Vanu self-liberation topics like that. Uh, paznia.com, P-A-Z-N-I-A.com to learn about, uh, the free Republic of Paznia and, uh, the second home network, uh, that we're building. Cause yeah, community is uh, obviously super important and, you know, local communities, we're trying to build a more kind of worldwide thing too. Um, I guess, uh, a, a network of second realms uh, per se, or network of, uh, self-sufficient homesteads and, and, uh, safe, safe places for, for self-liberators. So, um, that's Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A.com. Com. And then uh, finally, Libertarian Tech Publications, if uh, um, you're looking for any, I guess, uh, uh, books or strategy guides, uh, anarchist agorist fiction, um, or I guess we have uh, ghost phones and ghost pads too. So privacy tools, actually, you know, um, ways to enhance your digital privacy uh, in the digital second realm. So I guess uh, that's it. And Sec, thanks so much for the invitation, man. It's been, it's been an honor. Lots of, uh, yeah, again, like you said, there's lots, just lots of incredible insights, um, lots of great people. It's, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. So thanks, guys. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Um, well, let's go with Ray. Ray, uh, you want to plug some stuff? Um, yeah. Um, so you can check out our podcast, mine and Sex Lady Resonance, the Let's Make Some Shit podcast to maybe learn and try out some new skills with us. Um, I have an Etsy shop called The Willow's Gift, where you can find my art and herbal medicine that I make. Uh, my husband has agorist acres. If you need any seeds, if we don't have what you're looking for, we will get it for you. We actually are on farm match for our chickens. So if you are local, you can find us at Radiant Farms. And if you guys want to listen to me stumble through names I can't understand, you can listen to me narrate audiobooks for Agora the Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well that you're working on an easy one now so that's good yeah yeah i've been yeah, really she, enjoying she, this really doesn't one. know what she's talking about she she did the reading for homebrew and best industrial revolution by carson and it is definitely a mouthful to to read that book there's a lot of it's very wordy a lot of it packed yeah, yeah, really props to you that because i've been editing it so i've been having to listen to you and sometimes i'm actually paying attention and sometimes i'm kind of just Making sure that everything goes relatively smoothly, but smoothly. But you did a really good job. I'm, I'm pretty impressed considering all that's the. It's not an easy book. Yeah, it's not an easy book. Yeah, I've been listening to a couple of those while I'm doing chores and stuff, so those are great. Well, thank you. This next one, I think, will be much smoother. It has definitely been a much easier read, and I've just been enjoying reading them anyway. So <laughs> I don't care what you guys think about the way I read it. <laughs> <laughs> You're having fun either way. Hey, that's, that's right. A, that's what kind. That's a good attitude to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have to imagine Sisyphus happy. If anybody gets the reference, you get a cookie. Um, I don't eat cookies anyway. I don't. I also don't eat cookies. Um, I didn't DJ, get the plug reference. Plug. I was being smart ass because I didn't get the reference. But um, okay, did. so. No, I didn't. Wait, no, well, what's the reference? Oh, you didn't. Okay, I don't. Mind. That's why I it's, said I don't eat cookies Albert, anyway. Screw your prize. I don't it's care. It's Albert if I don't Camus. Care. It's a myth. Oh, you know, I'm I'm not okay, a scholar. Fine. I'm not a scholar, so I don't read all the. It's. But it's Camus. He's and, from, uh, anyway, so. You forget that he, I was statist until based, like 2013. He, I don't know who that is. He's based as fuck. I don't know. He uh, he wrote the myth of Sisyphus. It's a whole like. It's a oh. Whole, Book I, I guess I, yeah. I mean I I read the Greek stuff, not necessarily the everything else's stuff. But anyway, I'm okay. just talking out of my ass. If anybody is interested in radically reclaiming your health with real food, nice alliteration, um, you can follow me at Ketolicious. It's K E T O L I S H dot U S. It's a shitty name, but I'm working on something else anyway. Wait, didn't you do, don't you do something else? You wrote a book? 
Yeah, I, I am an author. I wrote a, a 150 plus recipes and it's called keto, Diabetic to Ketogenic and Reclaiming Your Health with Real Food. Sweet. Um, June, you got something to plug? Um, nothing really. I or don't anything really, to say? Uh, yeah, I don't really create anything, but I would just like to say thank you for having me on again. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. It's been a blast. Um, all right, well, I guess that's we'll wrap it up there. My eyes are actually getting heavy. The baby's going to outlast me tonight, I think. Um, but thanks for coming on, you guys. Um, I know it was a long one, so I appreciate you guys sticking around. And uh, this has been a blast. And if anybody wants an MP3 of this to put on whatever your stuff, well, we can do that too. Um, yours should have come by now. Oh, I didn't know I didn't get jerky yet. I don't said think. it was said it was delivered at five twenty four. Shit, I should go check the mail. It's been raining. We didn't check the mail. It's fine. It'll be all right. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone. Um, Penguin, do you have anything to add before we go? No. No, I said no. <laughs> oh. No. Okay. Um, it's been a very long podcast, but we had a lot of um, interesting. stuff stuff it's a real bangers in there that I, I i'm wondering if i we can want to clip out and just kind of either quote on the twitter or quote or just have like uh clips because there's some really cool stuff that you said in particular and uh yeah i, I well we have an odyssey channel for that go check out our odyssey channel our go to podcast on odyssey it has all the clips with all our zingers and bangers and i got a guy for that so Oh, oh, we do that. Okay, great. Good to know. Yeah, we do that. You knew that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> great. Yeah, we're, awesome. we can do that. <laughs> cool. Well, he's going to have to listen to the whole three-hour episode of this one. But, uh, no, it's been great. And I've come up with some new ideas on the fly. And I've really, re before doing that, rethought a lot of things based on what you guys have said and people that are here. Um, and it's been, so it's been really awesome just uh, from that aspect of it. Uh, yeah, that's so uh, you know, just kind of everything that I said today is not necessarily some kind of thing that I've been working on, other than kind of basic stuff that goes with the theme of the podcast. But a lot of it was just in response to some of the stuff that you guys said, so you really made me think about things a little bit differently, or just kind of inspired me to think in a certain direction. So, yeah, it's been pretty, I think it's been a productive conversation, yeah, definitely for real. Um, all right, well, you guys have yourselves a good weekend, and everybody be excellent to each other, and peace. Rayo was right. Freedom does indeed need more full-time professionals, not collective movement preachers seeking a coterie of followers, but explorers, inventors, developers of liberated life ways. Undoubtedly, numerous folks are truly seeking a way out of the servile society, but they don't see any options outside of political crusading or apathy. Many are being emotionally and physically broken down by the 9 to 5 grind, the daily pressures of the servile society, and the recognition of how truly unfree they really are. That being the case, our task as Venuans now becomes self-liberation and marketing in that order. Reason being, if we were ever going to see an alternative economy, a sovereign free port, a new libertarian country, or whatever other grandiose strategy comes into fruition, we need to first break people free from the servile society and into a lifestyle change of their choosing. Additionally, if we are ever going to see the abolition of the state, we must do our damnedest to eliminate the market demand for it. A great way to do that is by showing individuals that there are other options, and to help them in the process as much as possible. Some entrepreneurs may even be able to monetize such a venture in the form of consulting or the development of tools or services to ease the transition from the first realm to the second realm. Rayo's first book, Vanu the Search for Personal Freedom, was initially published in 1983. 35 plus years later, many of these strategies are just as practical now as they were then, if not more so thanks to the evolution of technology. Yet, some recommendations he and others posited are extremely outdated, destined to fail in the modern day. Vanu is based upon reality, not legality, and therefore, it will develop according to the external factors of the present time. Freedom is not free. It takes time, effort, money, an extreme amount of dedication, and a willingness to make sacrifices. 
It requires the willingness and ability to create, develop, and to problem solve, as we are the self-liberators of the 21st century, pioneering the path forward to a freer future. It is not for everybody, and neither is Vonnie. There's no better way to end this book than with these wise, timeless words from our friend and posthumous mentor, Rayo. Quote, a Vanuan to me is not just someone living in a particular manner. Lifestyles may change. A lifestyle which was Vanu 100 years ago may not be Vanu today. Some lifestyles Vanu today were not possible 100 years ago and may not be Vanu 50 years from now. A Vanuan is someone who places a high value on relative invulnerability to coercion. Someone for whom freedom is worth a fair amount, though not infinite, of effort, inconvenience, discomfort. To a Vanuan, Vanu is not just a means to other ends, nor is it an ultimate end. Like most qualities of life and life itself, it is both. A Vanuan will choose whatever way of living offers personal sovereignty, and will change lifestyle again and again if necessary." End quote. Your free future is closer than you think. This was an excerpt from my book, Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation, available in the Self-Liberation Bundle. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash SL Bundle to snag every book we offer at a huge discount. Currently 18 books. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash SL Bundle is where to go to pick that up. And to view our full catalog, please visit libertyunderattack.com. LUA Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.